you know, for years I've taken certain opinions on retro games as gospel. Namely, how games like Superman 64, E.T., Sewer Shark and Quest 64 are some of the worst games of all time. And you know what? We were lied to. So today, I'm going to take a look at some of the quote, worst games of all time and see if they live up to their infamy. So let's get started. This is Die Hard for the NES, and it's often considered as one of the worst games on that system. You play as John McClane, and you have to explore the Nakatomi Plaza, taking out the bad guys before they open the security locks to a vault containing 40 million dollars. And wow, this game is so ambitious. For starters, there's only 40 enemies in the game, and it lets you know where you're at in that counter whenever you pause the game. And instead of being a linear experience, this is actually a free roaming game that lets you explore the various tower floors whenever and however you want. In fact, it kind of reminds me a lot of the Metal Gear series in that regard. You even have limited visibility as you explore the various rooms and some basic stealth mechanics. At first, fighting enemies makes you feel like the deck is stacked against you, as they have better weapons and they fire in all directions while avoiding your attacks. But that's kind of what makes this game so brilliant, as this is all about setting up ambushes. So for example, if you listen to their radios, Hans Gruber will often tell you what floor they're moving to. And if you rush to the elevator, you can take them out by surprise, defeating them instantly. And as you play the game, you also learn where you should hide before attacking them, as well as how to lure them and even how to defeat them with a single shot. When you take them out, you can get their weapons, ammo and even flashbangs. But your gear will always be in short supply and you need to start considering the risk versus reward of wasting it on your foes in an open fight. And to make things more difficult, some parts of the tower are full of glass doors and windows. And if you fire blindly, you can screw yourself in the future by leaving glass shards all over the floor, which will damage your feet and make you walk slower for the rest of the game. So again, you have to consider if you want to fight out in the open and whether or not you want to fire blindly, which could potentially make your life more difficult for you down the line. And yes, there's a health bar for your feet, and if it goes down to zero, you start walking really slowly. Then there's the fact that this game is also running on a timer, so you'll need to defeat all 40 enemies before the safe is unlocked. So for example, walking up and down flights of stairs is a more stealthy approach, but will also cost you more time. The elevator on the other hand is instant, but it will also announce your presence whenever it's used. This is such a cool game, and you're constantly weighing your options as you play this, and it honestly feels truer to the movie than any of the games that launched on more powerful systems. And you can even take little detours and go on side quests that can extend the timer during your playthrough. This game is so ahead of its time, even if it is a little rougher on the edges. But I, for the life of me, cannot understand the pure slander this game has gotten over the years. So is this game bad? No, it's actually pretty great. Check this game out. This is Highlight for the NES, and is often considered as one of the worst RPGs ever made and also one of the worst NES games ever made. But now, here's a twist you might not know about. Highlight, or rather, the original PC-88 version of Highlight, is actually a really influential game series in Japan, and along with the Dragon Slayer games, it would influence some pretty major gaming series including the Ease games and even The Legend of Zelda. This game was THE action RPG game in Japan. So if that's the case, why is this game headed so much in the West? Well, for one thing, we're not playing the PC-88 version, instead, we're playing the NES version, which most Highlight fans consider it to be a pretty poor conversion of the game. Not only did it add a new soundtrack that did more harm than good, though for reference, 
I should point out that the original game did not have a soundtrack at all, but it also added a new magic system that felt tacked on at the last minute, and it removed the ability to save your progress at any time. And as if that weren't enough, we got the game in the West a full 5 years after the original PC-88 version launched in Japan. But whatever, let's just look at the game as is. And uh, yeah, it's not great. The idea is that you're supposed to grind for experience and then explore the open world for the various items you need to clear the game. The problem is that you're supposed to tackle each dungeon in order, as you'll need an item from the previous one to progress. But the issue is, you don't know what that order is, so you have to go by trial and error. Combat is done automatically, similarly to the early Ultima games, and it's usually a good idea to attack enemies from the side, or better yet, from the back. Unfortunately, it's rather easy to lose all your HP in mere seconds even if you're at max level fighting mid-range enemies, and if you do, you'll have to input a pretty lengthy password to continue. And that's really what ruins this game, how easily you lose and how much time you spend on the password screen. I mean, the original PC-88 version is definitely showing its age, but it did at least let you save anywhere at any time, which allowed you to quickly resume your quest, so being defeated wasn't as much of a punishment there. But on the NES, Hide Light becomes an exercise in patience and frustration. So what we're left with is a poor port of a 5 year old game that has also aged, with a soundtrack that will drive you insane and a password system that you'll be seeing a lot of. Yeah, you know what? This game is pretty terrible. I don't know if I'd call it the worst RPG ever, but I am gonna say it deserves its infamy. Hydlight would then be remade for the Sega Saturn as Virtual Hydlight, and this game is infamous for its goofy hero sprites and the fact that it runs at like, I don't know, 10 frames per second maybe? And that's outdoors, because indoors it runs at half that, partly because this game is actually running on a golf engine. No, really, this game is running on a game engine made for golf games. Just forget this hole and go on to the next one. Which explains so much. So, considering I hated the NES game and this one runs so poorly, it should be a slam dunk that I'm also gonna hate this one as well, right? Well, actually, no! I honestly really enjoyed Virtual Hydlight. For starters, Virtual Hydlight's world is randomized each time you play the game, giving you millions of possible combinations, and it even lets you write down the code for any given world if you happen to particularly enjoy it. Now, I've seen some people state that the randomized worlds are pointless because the game gives you a full map that tells you where you have to go to progress through your quest, and I feel that people who do this are missing the point. Yes, you have the option to play the game like this, but it's really meant to be a tutorial run. The real fun of Virtual Hydlight is in playing it in hard mode, where you begin without any equipment and the world map needs to be revealed as you explore the game. So as a result, Virtual Hydlight becomes an oddly immersive survival game, as you need to scrounge for any weapons and items you can get your hands on. But because this is hard mode and everything is randomized, you don't know what you're gonna get or what they even do, as the game will not tell you what each item does unless you equip it or use it. So you might end up wasting magical scrolls that would have been useful otherwise, or worse, you might equip a cursed weapon or armor that will drain your stats. And the game also has some strong roguelike elements, so if you get a game over, you gotta start from the beginning. I mean, don't get me wrong, the frame rate is the one thing about this game that I really hate, but playing this game I couldn't help but feel like virtual Highlight was a labor of love by the developers. It feels so odd and archaic in its design because it's essentially a PC-88 game remade for the Sega Saturn, but at the same time, it's also one of the most unique and immersive games of that generation, placing a very fun emphasis on exploration. I get that it's not for everyone, and that frame rate will be a deal breaker for many, but you know what? I really like Virtual Highlight.
This is a fun if misunderstood game. So I say, check this one out. This is Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest for the NES, and this is a weird one. During the mid-2000s, this game was slandered quite a bit online, but over the years, it seems to have regained some of its reputation back. The game deviates from your traditional Castlevania games by being closer to an action RPG. In fact, I might even call this one an early Metroidvania, though it doesn't strictly follow the formula. Anyway, in this game, you play as Simon Belmont, and once again, you need to stop Dracula from resurrecting. To do this, you need to travel around the world, talk to villagers to get clues, visit mansions or important locales, and retrieve the various pieces of Dracula's body while buying upgrades for Simon. These can include more powerful whips, the sub-weapons from the first game, or new items like the stake, which you use to break crystals holding a piece of Dracula's body. For the most part, the game plays a lot like the first Castlevania game, only in an open world setting. And personally, I really like this game, as I feel the action is fun and the music is superb. But some problems do hold it back a bit. For starters, it can be quite cryptic on where you need to go or what you have to do, as a lot of what the villagers tell you is either gibberish or outright lies, an issue that likely stems from poor translation. And there's also the issue that mansions and dungeons often have fake floors that force you to repeat entire segments, which just feels like pointless padding. Despite that, I feel that this is a pretty immersive game, and it really is fun drawing your own maps on where each path of the world connects to. Of course, the game does have the infamous time limit if you want to see the good ending, but to me, that never took away from how fun the game itself is. I also know some people complain about the day to night cycle, as the game interrupts what you're doing to shift between day and night, but again, I never had much of a problem with it. I feel that this game is flawed but was also trying something new at the time. And really, for all its flaws, the gameplay is still excellent, just perhaps not as focused or polished as its predecessor. But honestly, I struggle to see how this could be categorized as anything other than a good NES game. So its infamy is undeserved. Okay folks, story time. Back in the early 2000s, Teenage Justica downloaded an N64 emulator and played Castlevania 64. And I really love this game. So you can imagine how confused I was when years later it turned out that everyone on the internet hated this game. Castlevania 64 was the franchise's first foray into 3D and, in my opinion, it did a pretty good job at it, even if it did stumble in places. You have two characters to choose from, each with their own attack styles and slightly different storylines. Personally though, I'm not a big fan of Carrie. Her attacks are meant to home in on the enemy, which lets you move while attacking, which is a very good thing. But they also have a tendency to have a mind of their own, instead of going after what you were really aiming for. So I usually just pick the whip dude. And this game is a pretty interesting mix of Tomb Raider and Resident Evil. By that I mean that you'll have large levels to explore by platform key collecting and some minor puzzle solving reminiscent of Lara Croft's adventures on the PlayStation and Sega Saturn. But then you also have stages set inside Dracula's mansion where you're just going through the various rooms looking for items you can use while trying to make the best of your limited inventory, drawing closer comparisons with Resident Evil. The game is slower paced than previous Castlevanias, and the combat is generally fairly easy, as it basically amounts to auto-aiming on two enemies and hit them with your whip. In fact, I could never seem to find a proper use for my sub-weapons, as they never seem to work as intended. 
I think the biggest issue with this game are the horrible camera controls. You have multiple camera settings to use, but none of them are particularly great. There's times where I can't even see where I'm going, or I just have to wait until the camera decides to point at what I'm looking at, which wouldn't be an issue if there weren't so many levels where enemies are constantly respawning. And yet, Castlevania 64's slower pace actually really works towards the game's favor. Most 3D Castlevania games tend to be character action games, where you're pulling awesome combos on enemies and destroying everything in your path, which, don't get me wrong, I love that too. But this game asks the question of what it would feel like to be a lone adventurer trespassing into Dracula's realm and trying to survive her quest. It actually reminds me a lot of Hydelight in that regard. There's something immersive and oddly depressing about the game's tone that speaks to me. You don't feel like you're an invincible hero, but rather like someone whose odds are stacked against you. I also really like how the game takes its time to set the mood and there's even a day to night cycle with different characters being available at different times. There's something about the dialogue and survival horror-like tone to this game that I feel was lost in the later Castlevania games, and the mix of these two genres that by all accounts should not mix works really well here. So, is this game good? Absolutely. It does not deserve the infamy it gets. This is Dark Castle for the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive and wow this game is bad. This is a light puzzle platformer and your controls are super stiff, as not only are they very slow, but it's also really easy to miss a jump, especially when you're supposed to grab onto ropes, because it feels like that you need to be at a specific distance before making that jump, and if you're off even by a few pixels, you're done. You can throw stones to defend yourself but your aiming is a bit clumsy, as you need to rotate your arm a set number of degrees which takes quite a bit of time and makes it very easy to miss your target, making it impossible for you to defend yourself when you're in a bind. And as if that weren't enough, you're constantly listening to a poor rendition of Bach's Tocat and Fuge, which normally I wouldn't mind as I actually enjoy this song, but man, Electronic Arts really went for the worst possible rendition on the Mega Drive sound chip. The interesting thing is that this game was originally launched for Macintosh computers, where it was well received. For one thing, aiming was done by pointing with the mouse, and the game just generally controlled better. And, I mean, look at the game! This was never meant to be a $60 full release, it was meant to be a small game that you'd play to pass the time. It's like if someone tried to port Minesweeper onto the Sega Genesis 5 years after the fact, while also making the port somehow worse than the original. Dark Castle is a black hole where all fun disappears into the void and is sent to the Shadow Realm. This is a terrible game that should have never been made, and it absolutely deserves its infamy. The game that launched a million YouTube poops. I hope she made lots of spaghetti. This is Hotel Mario for the Philips CDI. You play as Mario and Princess Peach has been kidnapped yet again. And she's being held in a hotel, I guess? The princess is now a permanent guest at one of my seven Koopa hotels. Eh, sure, why not? Anyway, this is a single screen arcade platformer where your goal is to close every door in each floor. To do this, you'll have to jump on enemies, collect 30 coins for extra lives, and power ups like the mushroom and fire flower. The game is pretty simple, but it's actually kind of fun. Different enemies will have different move speeds or require more hits to bring down, and some will even open closed doors, which will in turn spawn more enemies, while other times, doors will automatically open themselves 
walls, which will also spawn more enemies. Sometimes I would lose a life because a door would open right on top of me while spawning a new enemy. But on the other hand, I did discover that once you pick up the fire flower, you're pretty much invincible. But yeah, this is a pretty good game. And each hotel has a boss fight against one of the Koopalings. And different hotels have different gimmicks, like this one where the lights go out on occasion. I feel like Hotel Mario could have used more power-ups, more enemy types and in general be more chaotic, but as it is, this is a pretty decent game. And is not deserving of its infamy. And here it is, the infamous Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde for the NES, often considered as the worst game on that system. This is a side-scrolling platformer in which you control Dr. Jekyll and your job is to just basically reach the end of the level. The problem is that the doctor moves very slowly and his jumping kinda sucks if I'm being honest. You also have a cane attack which does nothing really and as far as I can tell it has no use. Now, one interesting idea this game has is that you actually have two health bars, one for your life and one for your state of mind, and any damage you receive can reduce different amounts of one, or the other, or both. If your life reaches zero, that's game over, but if your mental meter reaches zero, you turn into Mr. Hyde. When you play as Mr. Hyde, the game changes into a forced scrolling level. The setting will also change to night and you begin on the opposite end of the level. And Mr. Hyde will now shoot fireballs and he generally controls pretty well. So what happens now is, you need to defeat enemies to restore your mental health and go back to being Dr. Jekyll. Not only that, but when you do this, you also heal your life meter. So it does kind of sound that you can just force a Hyde transformation to heal up and then go back to being Dr. Jekyll. Jekyll, right? Well, kind of. You see, as I mentioned before, Hyde's portions force you to scroll, and if he reaches the same portion of the level where Dr. Jekyll is, you'll get a game over. So there's a very interesting element of risk versus reward with managing your personas. Really, the main issue with this game is that it's just so boring. The Hyde portions are fine, I guess, but as Jekyll all you do is walk slowly and avoid enemies, and sometimes you'll even have to walk long stretches where nothing happens, because the game does not take into account elevation, so it will just keep spawning enemies that'll never touch you. I feel like there's a good idea hiding behind this game, but the execution just completely fails at it. I don't think this game is as cryptic as people have made it out to be, but it really is one of the most boring games I've played in a long time. And for that reason, I'm going to say it deserves its infamy. <laughs> This is Quest 64, the infamous Nintendo 64 RPG that has sparked decades of hate, but is now seeing something of a resurgence in online spaces, with people saying that it's actually a misunderstood hidden gem. So I was curious to see where the needle would land on this one, and after spending a good deal of time on it, I can safely say that Quest 64 is… fine. It's fine. This is just an average, mediocre, middle-of-the-road RPG that is neither good nor bad. I honestly don't get why there's so much discourse around this game. I've seen it on lists of the worst RPGs of all time, and I mean, it's not even the worst RPG in this video. All I can think of is that N64 fans were so desperate for some kind of answer to Final Fantasy VII, which this game clearly isn't, that they've now spent the next 30 years pretending that this is one of the worst RPGs of all time. When in reality, if this had launched for any other gaming system of the time, no one would bat an eye one way or the other. 
And part of the reason for that is that Quest 64 is very clearly meant to be an introductory RPG to those unfamiliar with the genre. As a result, you only play as one character and there's no currency. You get all your items for free by either talking to NPCs or exploring the world. And if you happen to lose, the game just sends you back to the nearest end while keeping all the experience you've gained along the way. I will say that just because this is an introductory RPG, it doesn't stop this game from having some cool ideas. You can explore the world for items, but also for hidden upgrades to your magic. And I like how combat is a mix of turn-based and real-time, as you're given a small range of movement each turn, where you need to find the optimal position for either defense or offense, depending on how you wish to tackle each random encounter. Some enemies can only damage you at a distance but not up close, while others have different attacks depending on how close or how far you are from them. This is actually a pretty neat mechanic, though I do find it weird how your staff seems to be the most powerful weapon in the game. At least the game is pretty and the music is kinda good in places, but overall, this game isn't bad, it's just average. And I can think of far worse RPGs than this one. This is Superman 64 for the Nintendo 64, the game where, according to the internet, all you do is fly through rings and then give up in frustration. And well, I will say this, I did give up on this game in frustration, but not for the reasons you might think. I'll just go ahead and say it, guys, the rings are not that bad. I've gotten past every ring section I came across on my second attempt. I mean, not only are they not that difficult, they're also really short at about a minute each. Now granted, once you do beat a ring section, the game gives you a goal in like 5 seconds to complete it, which of course means I lost and had to redo it all over again before I even knew what I was supposed to do in the first place. But again, these sections were also really easy and I got through all of them on my second attempt as well. I don't know, maybe it's because I was using the Switch Pro Controller, but they were all kind of easy, and I was actually enjoying myself during these portions. I even went off the beaten path and went exploring on my own, and I was very impressed at how they created a full-fledged city for you to explore, but never actually gave you the chance to do so. If I had to guess, I'd say Superman 64 was originally meant to be a free-roaming game with the occasional linear missions on the side, but because the game is so so <laughs> clearly unfinished, they would end up scrapping all of that. I mean, don't get me wrong, this game is bad, it's really bad, but the ring sections and challenges aren't the real problem here, it's the beat em up levels. Oh my god, not only do they run terribly, but the level layout is confusing as all hell. Your controls are awful, the enemies are really boring to fight, and it's hard to tell where you're supposed to go because the game barely gives you any direction. So overall, yeah, this game is pretty terrible and I do think it deserves its infamy solely because it's so clearly unfinished. But the ring sections though, yeah, not that bad actually. This is Heavy Nova for the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive, a beat em up style game where you control a giant mech and fight other giant mechs, though the controls are closer to that of a fighting game. It kind of reminds me of Matt Stalker in that regard, except Matt Stalker actually does a good job at what he's trying to do, and Heavy Nova is honestly terrible. I mean, I like the presentation of the game, and at first it doesn't seem so bad. There's a bit of an input delay on your character, but it's a giant mech, so. 
that's understandable. But no, the problems really start to show when you're fighting against the boss. You see, as you take damage, this bar starts to go down. And the more it drops, the bigger your input delay gets. So it can get to a point where you can be pressing a button for over 5 seconds and nothing happens. So if the boss gets a couple of hits on you, you can literally become stuck in an infinite hit loop. Do you see this? I literally cannot get out of this. I'm stuck. My character will not react. Get up, man! Get up! Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh, fuck this game. Yeah, this game is trash. Infamy completely deserved. This is Sewer Shark, an unreal shooter that was also a pack-end game for the Sega CD. You play as a... Actually, it's not very clear. You're like a spaceship pilot that navigates across massive sewers sticking out mutant rats. So, I guess you're basically a space janitor. And, well, it's an on-rail shooter for the Sega CD. So, it's the style of game where all you do is move the cursor to wherever your next enemy is and fire at it. Relax! Pretend it's a game. Maybe it'll even be fun. In fact, there aren't even any power-ups or weapon pickups in this game. The weapon you start with is the weapon you'll be using at the end of the game. Though the game does require you to at least be careful where you aim. Because your energy meter is constantly going down, so you can't just fire blindly. One interesting feature the game has that seems to confuse newcomers is that you need to follow the voice input directions you're given by the characters, as they'll tell you to navigate up, down, left or right in a specific order. Order. We got some hungry critters bearing 12, 3, 12. And if you mess up, you're gone. Overall, I think the game is actually pretty fun. Not amazing by any means, but a decent game, and not really deserving of the hate it gets. And speaking of the Sega CD, we have of course the poster child of bad FMV games, Night Trap. In this game, you're a secret agent targeting a family of vampires who have lured in a group of Eddie's teenagers to meet their demise. And so, you need to check out the various security cameras and spring traps to save the kids. Occasionally, some of your special forces members will also raid the house and you need to save them as well, as they're arguably more incompetent than the unwitting kids. I've actually seen all of Night Trap as a full movie on YouTube, and not gonna lie, this movie is fun as hell. I especially like any scene with the dad. Please call me Victor. So charming. And this is my wife, Sheila. This dude shoots through scenery as if it were made of chocolate, and I love it. Curious little bunch. What's wrong? Well, there's something about Kelly. Hmm, woman's intuition again, huh? <laughs> We did 20 ticks, and that was the best one. The game's difficulty comes from the fact that you can only spring traps if you have the right color code at the right moment, and you won't know if the code has changed or not unless you happen to be following the right camera at the right time when someone messes with the code. You also have to constantly be switching cameras to find and capture goons while they're still in the correct position. So the game ends up being oddly designed where you need to look away from the action, story and all the cool stuff just to do the things you need to do to progress through the game. This was actually fixed in modern releases as they give multiple cameras running at the same time, allowing you to see everything at once. But on the Sega CD, you just need to guess and keep shifting. And if you happen to miss a code change, well, you're screwed. 
I've got a real problem with this one because I love this game and I think it's awesome. But I also think the Sega CD version is the worst way of playing this game. So I'm gonna say it's a good game and that it's infamy only applies to the Sega CD version. This is Mortal Kombat Mythology Sub-Zero for the PlayStation. And this is a side scroller for the PS1 in which you only play as Sub-Zero. Also, this was the first PlayStation game I ever owned as a kid, when I begged my parents to buy me a PlayStation 1 at the time. And believe it or not, I used to love this game. So I was a little surprised to learn people hate it now. Playing it now though, I can safely say I clearly had no standards back then because yikes, this game is so bad. And the worst part is that it didn't need to be because the concept is solid. An action adventure game starring Sub-Zero. You even have an inventory where you can use and combine items to replenish health, shield you from damage and recover mana so you can use your ice powers. And you even gain experience as you defeat enemies which unlock more of Sub-Zero's trademark moves. But the the level design is incredibly sadistic, filled with one-hit death traps and leaps of faith where you need to jump somewhere but you don't know where the ground actually is. So you simply have to hope that you made the correct jump. Making everything worse is the fact the controls are super awkward, overly complicated and extremely stiff. Even the act of turning is a major problem. And you just gotta love when you've cleared a group of vents that kill death traps only to realize you're missing a key item and now you gotta go back and avoid those death traps all over again. And when I was recording gameplay for this video, I came across more than a few graphical glitches. And this isn't emulator footage either, I captured these on real hardware. Yeah, this kid is pretty terrible and deserves its infamy. Little Stika, you deserved better. From one bad Mortal Kombat game to another, this is Mortal Kombat Advance for the GBA and this was meant to be a port of Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 for the Nintendo handheld system, but what we got was a complete disaster of a game. First of all, the characters are at a pretty low resolution and yeah, I get it, it's a GBA, that's to be expected. But look at how much vertical empty room you've got now. And now compare that to Street Fighter 2 on the GBA, which did a better job at managing screen crunch. But whatever, that's the small stuff. What really destroys this port is how broken it is. The physics are completely wrong for the game, to the point where it doesn't feel like Ultimate Mortal Kombat at all. It feels like some other fighting game running that just so happens to have Mortal Kombat sprites layered on top. The AI also acts differently, namely in how it does not know how to react against a series of jump kicks. Seriously, you can beat the whole game by just spamming these. This is just a disaster of a port. Infamy deserved. This is Friday the 13th for the NES and I love this game. I don't know what it is with ambitious movie to game tie-ins for the NES being slandered, but this game does not deserve its infamy. I mean, for one thing, it was made by Atlas, the same studio behind the Persona and Shin Megami Tensei games. You play as a group of camp counselors and you need to stop Jason and save the children in the camp. So you can switch between the various counselors and they all have different stats like walking speeds and HP. 
HP. You need to travel around the camp and once you pick up the ladder by defeating random zombies, you have to go to the various houses, explore them in this Shin Megami Tensei Sudo 3D style and light the fireplaces. And once that's done, you'll have to look for keys, explore caves and even Jason's hut. Along the way, you'll pick up better weapons and healing items, all the while Jason will occasionally attack one of the houses with children inside. You usually have enough time to reach the house, but if you don't, you can simply switch to the nearest camp counselor. And the cool thing is, is that the game also has a day-to-night cycle, and the closer you are to night time, the more often will Jason start to stalk you specifically. So you can fight them out in the open, while rowing your boat, or even in these pseudo 3D areas where the game basically becomes Punch-Out. It's actually kind of a genius system, because you never know whether or not Jason is around the corner, so you're always playing the game afraid that he's going to surprise you. It kind of reminds me of the Nemesis system from Resident Evil, except this game did it for the NES, which is simply incredible. Honestly, this game is incredible, and it manages to be great while being completely faithful to the movies. Infamy absolutely undeserved. Yes, the game that sparked a thousand YouTube videos, the original worst game of all time, E.T. for the Atari 2600. In this game, you play as E.T. and you need to collect telephone parts to phone home while avoiding the FBI agent and the scientist. If they catch you, they either take one of your pieces or send you to jail or both. And you collect pieces by falling into these holes, picking them up and then flying out of them. And you need to do all of this while managing your constantly depleting energy levels. So for example, if you use your flight powers before landing on a hole, you actually save some energy. And and you can activate your super speed to get away from enemies at the cost of more energy. And that's it, really. I mean, it's an Atari 2600 game, what did you expect? You can also collect candy, which you can give to Elliot for an extra phone piece, though I could never seem to find them. Honestly, I think this game gained its infamy due to three major issues, two of which aren't even the game's fault. The first is that your objective is cryptic, but it becomes clear once you read the manual and figure out what you need to do, which massively improves the experience. The other issue is that the game automatically defaults to the hardest setting, which explains why people never seem to get very far in this game. But if you don't mind messing with the dip switches, you can then select the normal or easy difficulties instead. So again, another case of people not reading the manual. But the final issue is from the game itself, and that is that you're constantly falling into these holes and it gets so old. Oh my god. The issue is that the hit detection for these holes is extremely unforgiving. Even when I fly out of them, the game keeps sending me back because it does not let me fly out far enough out of their range. And this is the game's greatest problem. So much so that some fans have taken upon themselves to creating a patched version that makes the holes less punishing. Because honestly, other than this particular issue, the rest of E.T. is really just your normal average Atari game. As it is though, E.T. is just regular bad, not worst of all time bad. I've played worse, I've played worse, I've played worse, and I have played worse. It's a bad game. But it's also overhated. And there we have it, a look at some of the worst games of all time. Are there any games I missed? Let me know in the comments. In the meantime, I'd like to thank all my Patreon supporters, including Applesauce, Dr. Reverend Crush and Alejandro Guia de la Muñoza. Thank you for helping make the channel better. Anyway, I hope you have a great day, bye!